Hello, my name is Benjamin Berger, and this is the second part of a two-part series of videos that I've been doing um, addressing the question of how do you get a job as a paleontologist. And this is the second video. The first video I talked a little bit about um, the education required, the years of education required to become a paleontologist. And reading everyone's comments, uh, I realized that there's a lot of education that you need to become a paleontologist. And it is something you have to do with a lot of passion and a lot of love for the subject. It's not something you can kind of go into because you think you'll make money doing it. It's a, it's a career that you go down because you're really in love with uh, collecting uh, studying fossils and you can't see yourself doing anything anything else with your life that's the you really want to spend your time doing it and it's totally okay if you want to have a career in something else uh, that maybe is more guaranteed of it of a steady income and do paleontology as a hobby and that's totally fine there's lots of museums you can volunteer with and many people that I know when they retire become paleontologists um, after they retire and really start dedicating their lives to it but if you really want to spend the rest of your life doing paleontology uh, like I did um, are there careers are there jobs that you can have after you go through this whole process of becoming educated and there are, and so this video I want to put together to really sort of emphasize where the careers are in paleontology, what type of job prospects are there out there for people who are trained as paleontologists. Now, if you're interested, there's a really good essay by uh, Don Prothrow. Uh, he wrote it in this, in this book called Greenhouse of the Dinosaurs, and the title of his essay is called Kids, Dinosaurs, and the Future of Paleontology. And it's a really good read. Um, I call it the dad talk because he's fairly pessimistic about the future of paleontology. And so he's, he's very realistic. He, he kind of lays out what, what the prospect is of getting jobs and where those jobs are. It's a very good essay. Um, I recommend reading it and my students to read it as well um, because it goes into some more detail than I will be able to in this video. Now, what I thought I'd do is kind of give you kind of a quick history of paleontology jobs or where the jobs were in various points in, in history, particularly here in the United States. But this could be applied to other countries as well, depending on um, the politics of each country and, and how the laws are sort of enacted and stuff in terms of where people are, are employed. So in the early days, and I'm talking early, like 1820 to 1920, um, so before the the First World War, um, the way paleontologists got hired was either they were impoverished amateurs like Mary Anning and, and those folks who would go out and collect fossils, prepare the fossils, get them really nice, and then sell them to the other type of paleontologists, which were the wealthy uh, scientists, the wealthy philanthropist who was going to have a museum, put together a museum, and would buy these fossils from these amateurs that would go out and collect uh, fossils. So if you were an aspiring paleontologist, you know, over 100 years ago, uh, you would try to impress these, uh, these wealthy individuals that you could find the coolest and the most amazing dinosaurs or pterosaurs or weird extinct creatures out there and that you could bring them to the museum. And so that's how a lot of people made their livings. The Sternbergs were a very uh, family of, of amateur paleontologists became world fat, world class collectors of dinosaurs. And so you had that type of, of uh, people that would get into paleontology working for some of these people. Now some of them were, were uh, educated as uh, geologists. In fact, later on, as you get into the 20th century, most of them had gone to college and had college degrees in geology, had gone through the process of graduate school, had a master's degree, and were working for museums. Things changed dramatically after the First World War, after the Great Depression, and after the Second World War. Because most of those individuals that had a lot of that wealth, um, the robber barons of that time period, like Andrew Carnegie, for example, they didn't have as many as much funds after after those three big big events in the 20th century, and so paleontologists really had to kind of scramble uh, to try to find those types of jobs that existed in the past. Um, a good example is a paleontologist that bracketed that time period, and that was the famous mammalian paleontologist G.G. Simpson 
who worked at the American Museum for many years. And he, he in, in one of his books, he mentioned that he gave his liver to funding his research, meaning what he would do is he would basically try to meet wealthy individuals who were inclined to help fund his research, and he would take them out to drinks, and he would wine and dine them, try to convince them that his expedition to the Amazon in South America, where he's doing work, or in uh, the uh, in Patagonia, you know, was worth, you know, investing some money in. And so he spent a lot of time whining and dining and drinking with uh, patrons, trying to get them to support him, especially during those hard years during the Great Depression. Uh, so it was very difficult to get funds to do any sort of uh, expeditions or collecting of fossils during that period of time. After World War II, uh, there were still paleontologists who were working and um, most of them were working in the fields of um, teaching of academia, teaching at universities. Um, and during that time period, there was also lots of universities that had paleontologists that would teach at the university. And paleontologists were great because they could teach a variety of courses. So many small universities had paleontologists working for them because they could teach you know, biology and geology and anatomy and all those sorts of things. Uh, some of the most famous paleontologists actually taught at medical schools, and they taught anatomy. In fact, Joseph Leidy, uh, the first American sort of vertebrate paleontologist, was a, a professor of anatomy in Pennsylvania. Um, Richard Owen, who came up with the term dinosauria, his, his job was teaching anatomy to surgeons in, in London. So many of these uh, famous paleontologists worked in medical schools, and that's true today. In fact, most, many of my colleagues actually teach anatomy at medical school. Uh, when I took anatomy, gross anatomy, embryology, those types of courses, I was taking the same course that MD students that were training to become doctors were taking. So I was in the same classroom. Our professor was a paleoanthropologist. So those types of uh, teaching opportunities still exist. In fact, I'm married to an anatomist who teaches anatomy to, to uh, aspiring medical, uh, medical professionals. So. Those types of jobs exist, and so many paleontologists teach anatomy, and then in the summer, when they have time off, they go out in the field and collect fossils. And in fact, many famous dinosaur paleontologists, um, like Larry Whitmer, is a uh, works in a medical uh, medical program. So that's where a lot of jobs are. Um, museums kind of struggled. And, and have really struggled recently. Um, most of the funding that they get now is from city and state governments that help support them. So it's dependent really on sort of the taxpayers and whether they're willing to have uh, a natural history museum or not. And, and they're not reliant on you know, wealthy uh, donors donating money to their cause. So those jobs are sort of decreasing in number. There's still occasionally um, paleontologists that work at museums, but you'd be surprised at how few paleontologists work at some of these really large museums. Uh, one of the things that was also a big employer of paleontologists, uh, especially in the, in the 20th century, was geological surveys, uh, particularly invertebrate paleontologists um, and paleobotanists were hired by geological surveys. Now, in the United States, after the Civil War, the, the federal government realized that they needed cartographers, they needed map makers to go out and map the country um, because they didn't have good maps before that um, time period. They had some, but they really realized the importance of knowing where you were, having really good maps. And so after the very successful and very famous expeditions of John Wesley Powell down the Green and Colorado Rivers here in Utah, uh, th there was a lot of funding that was going into the establishment of the United States Geological Survey, so a geological survey. And they could hire people to go out and map uh, the geological layers, uh, coll collect and study the fossils, build up uh, repositories and museum collections to study those fossils and to provide dating for the various layers of rocks. And so it was really, really successful. And many invertebrate paleontologists worked for the uh, United States Geological uh, uh, Survey. Um, however, in about 1990, around the early 90s, 
the federal government kind of stripped off all paleontology research at the federal level. Uh, this was during a period of, of fiscal conservatism. It was also sort of tight-fistedness with the government. And so the USGS sort of got rid of all of their, a lot of their geological research that they did, especially with paleontology and um, mining sort of interests, and they've gone in other directions. Um, and so that whole division of the USGS kind of is gone. In fact, their collections are now sort of distributed with other museum entities like the Smithsonian. But in any case, the um, that employed a lot of, of uh, paleontologists, but that's not really quite true anymore here in the United States, although in other countries, geological surveys are also a big employer of paleontologists. With the sort of decline of federal paleontologists, you saw the rise of freelance consultant paleontologists here in the United States. Um, because the laws still were on the books to protect fossils, and so any fossils that were um, that might be damaged through construction projects, particularly highway projects, um, and uh, oil and gas pipeline projects that are on federal land in which the fossils in the ground are protected, required paleontologists to go out and salvage those, those fossils. And so there was a growing demand starting in the 1970s, but really today has become the biggest employer of paleontologists, and that is doing salvage work um, in collecting fossils that are in the path of roads and highways and oil and gas pipelines. And that's particularly true in the American West, where there's a huge population explosion, uh, people moving to the West. Uh, many of these cities are growing very rapidly, and they're building a lot of infrastructure, and a lot of the infrastructure, the fossils, are protected, and they have to be uh, collected, prepared, and put into museums to uh, to make sure that they are not damaged in the process of construction. So I've worked as a consultant paleontologist on a lot of jobs, and that's where a lot of my students actually go into is, is doing uh, paleontology consulting type work. Um, and that's where most of the paleontologists in the United States are actually employed, is either in medical universities teaching or doing consultants working out in the field. Um, there are other jobs in paleontology, um, and I wrote a blog post that I'll link below um, about four years ago on various other types of jobs that people have no been known to do. Um, I got a couple comments about doing, uh, becoming a dinosaur artist, for example, and becoming an artist who works uh, in paleontology. And paleontology and artwork kind of, um, it depends on, on, on on how you approach it. So I know I have colleagues that have basically, um, they're paleontologists, but they're also really good artists. And so they use their artwork in, in their research and they put in their artwork uh, in their research. Examples of these types of people would be like um, Bob Bakker, uh, Greg Paul, um, some of these people that do you know amazing you know, uh, artwork. Um, and they incorporate that into their into their research and, and publishing books and things like that with their artwork. Uh, then you have the other spectrum, and that is that artists that also like to depict dinosaurs in their artwork. And so they're not necessarily paleontology uh, trained, but they're really good artists, amazing artists, and they can do uh, uh, really good reconstructions of dinosaurs. And people like this would be like James Gurney, who did Dinotopia. He's a great example of an artist that incorporates dinosaurs in their artwork and gets a lot of, of work uh, doing uh, sort of um, freelance work for various magazines and like National Geographic and Scientific America. They're looking at a really good glossy illustration for a new dinosaur discovery. So there are those types of jobs. The other job that a lot of people are interested in is going into doing uh, computer animation and doing game development. And again, that's you know having a really good background in terms of the anatomy. So comparative anatomy is really important if you're going to go into that field. Um, also biomechanics, uh, understanding how vectors work and how animals move. Um, and knowing some of the physics, and also the physics of light, and how light changes and works on, on making form in a two-dimensional sort of uh, screen.
So there are lots of jobs out there in those types of fields that probably are not the more traditional field of going into paleontology. So I really want to uh, thank many of my um, patrons for supporting me and without your support I probably wouldn't be making these videos. I was hoping to get this video out uh, on Friday but life has been super busy and I haven't had a chance to do uh, to get it up until Monday. So I'm hoping to keep get these videos out once a week. Hopefully next Friday I'll have another video out for you guys. But I want to really thank um, my my patrons at the Eohippus level and uh, a shout out to uh, Arctotus1811, Dan Chapshaw, Justin Bovey, um, Pablo, uh, Luzato Figuez, um, and then all my little trilobite supporters who contribute a dollar for my videos. Um, thanks for your support. I'm hoping to get out in the field and do another Rocks of Utah episode because it's been beautiful weather uh, lately. Hopefully things won't be so busy with the beginning of classes and doing all my, my day job. Um, so I'll try to keep posting these videos and I hope to see you uh, next week with a new new video. Thank you for watching.